Well, uh, if you're a guest this morning, my name is David Bush. I'm one of the pastors here at Palm Vista, uh, and it's a privilege to have you with us. Uh, we are starting a new series for the summer in the book of James, in the book of James. And we're calling this series a Gospel Community Handbook, a Gospel Community Handbook. And uh, the idea of this series uh, is, is that we're going to be looking at what does it mean for us to be a gospel community, a community with a gospel culture. In this section of James, we're actually starting a little bit into the first chapter because these uh, couple of chapters in James, James is unpacking for the church what it means to live the gospel out with our lives together, together. Um, James, if, if you're not familiar, he's the brother of Jesus, so he had a, uh, some good access to Jesus. And uh, the book of James is written later in his life, after the diaspora, after uh, many of James's church members have been pushed out of Jerusalem, spread about uh, the, the, the whole Roman kingdom. And he's writing to them uh, to uh, talk to them how to dwell together in a place where there's great diversity. So James 1.1, 1, 1, the book opens by him saying, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. So that's thinking, think of the 12 tribes of Israel, except these are the people of God now spread all over the place in the dispersion. How do we have community together? In the dispersion in the Roman uh, diaspora, uh, you've got rich and poor dwelling together in the church. You've got Jew and Gentile with historic uh, conflict, historic racial tension. You've got the immigrant and the native, people who don't belong there now dwelling there, and, and people who are exiles from their homeland. Uh, any of our brothers and sisters here know that experience? Living in a place where people have been there for many generations, and, and now they've got to build gospel community together. So James' concern in this part of the book is, is how does a group of misfits get along together in the church? He's going he's gonna to tell us, and we're really going to dive into that in detail. This week's passage is something like James giving the, the chapter headings of his uh, gospel community handbook, and we're going to unpack it over the weeks to come. So if you would, turn with me to James chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 19 and go to verse 27. So James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27. This is the word of of the Lord. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror, for he looks at himself and at once goes away and forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus, I pray that you would reveal your gospel to us in this passage, Lord God. Would you show us how good you have been to us, Lord God, and may, uh, may we take deep roots in the gospel as a community, and Lord, may those gospel roots produce gospel fruit together. Uh, may you produce at Palm Vista a community that has a gospel culture that the way that we speak, the way that we feel, the way that we act, what we do with our hands, our hearts, our lips, all of it, Lord God, would be a product that reflects the beauty of the gospel. Would you convict hearts this morning? Would you uh, 
Give sinners repentance. Would you encourage your people? I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So I actually grew up in central Florida. uh, And uh, in my backyard growing up, we had uh, a number of fruit trees. My favorite was this tangerine tree. When I was little, it was little, but by the time I was a young man, this tangerine tree was huge, and it would grow, uh, no, no kidding, like grapefruit-sized tangerines, uh, and these things were delicious. Like, you, just with one finger, you'd crack that thing open, and the juice starts going everywhere, and you could peel it apart. It was incredible. Uh, I love tangerines, and my mom always thought, because everything grew so well in our backyard, it's because she was just an incredible gardener. Uh, she would plant tangerines, she planted uh, oranges and all kinds of things. They just grow up into these wonderful, fertile, uh, like paradise in my backyard. Um, and then she moved to another state and tried planting things there and everything died. Because <laughs> uh, she didn't water it, she didn't like fertilize it. She just thought that just by her planting it, it was what made it grow so beautifully. Uh, come to find out, where I grew up used to be like an orange grove and pasture land, and it had like super duper rich soil that was like rich and deep and like wet or whatever. I don't know anything about plants. Uh, but it, it grew incredible fruit and incredible uh, plants that just, just popped up out of the soil and had all this bountiful fruit. And, and, and what, what James is doing this morning is he is calling us to be sure that where we, we plant the culture of our church is a, a place that is rich, fertile soil. Uh, that we want the, the culture of the church to be rooted and, and, and grounded, to go deep into gospel-fertilized soil. Um, otherwise, it's going to be like the plants my mom planted later in her life that shrivel up and have no fruit. The, the main idea, the big idea this morning is this, to, cult, to cultivate gospel community, that we ought to be a people who cultivate gospel community. The first way we're to do that is by replacing rage with gentleness, replacing rage with gentleness. Um, James, in in this text, is giving us three specific fruits of gospel culture, Um, but I don't want you to think of these as three separate fruits, but really uh, three perspectives on the same fruit. There are three uh, ways of looking at that same tangerine, three slices of the tangerine, you might say. Uh, And and the first of those is is to replace rage with gentleness. Look in verse 19. He says, know this, my beloved brothers. You see see his community concern there? James is speaking to his brothers. It's It's a family meeting. He says, know this, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So those are the three. Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. And then he says, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of of God. It, it doesn't produce the righteousness of God. When James speaks of anger here, he's certainly speaking of, of, of those outbursts of anger, like, like the quick heat of a microwave, you know, that jumps up, that rage when our uh, children hit us in the ankles or don't listen to us. I don't know why children hit us in the ankles. Uh, when, they, when they don't obey, when, when we're trying to get under the Palmetto on 57th Avenue, that kind of rage, right, it, it just goes hot very fast. But he's also speaking about uh, a deeper, settled anger, uh, a sort of settled cynicism. This rage can also speak of of a uh, preheated oven type rage. It's just always at a high temperature. There's this baseline of unforgiveness and bitterness. It's not fertile soil for gospel fruit. And he says this is a problem for gospel community because that type of anger, both the, the heated, quick responses of anger, as well as that settled cynicism and unforgiveness under the surface, uh, it, it doesn't produce the righteousness of God. That is, the righteousness that pleases God or that requires by God. It, it can produce short-term results, right? A, a sharp word at the right time can get someone to step in line and follow your commands, Um, uh, but it's not going to produce the long-term results that God requires. The righteousness that pleases God isn't just outward obedience to a set of rules, but an an inward delight in God, an orientation of the heart that treasures God and obeys out of the the abundance of the heart in gratitude towards a God who loves it. 
So, so rage and anger can sear the outside of the chicken, but it leaves the inside raw, right? It looks good on the outside, but inside it's festering. And that's exactly what a community that has this sort of underlying cynicism and anger, it, it produces that kind of short-term external behavior. That's not the righteousness that pleases God. It's also not the way that God produces righteousness in us, is it? The scriptures tell us that it is the kindness of God, it's the mercy of God that leads us to repentance. When, when God revealed himself to Moses as he's about to go and lead the people out of Egypt, how does, how, how does God reveal himself to him? Actually, on the mountain, he says, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with Moses and proclaimed the name of the Lord. What name did, did God give Moses? I am God the angry. I am God the righteous. No, he says, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, Yahweh, the Lord, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious. Same word here slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. He goes on to speak of his wrath upon the unjust, but he begins with his character of slow to anger, patient, and abounding in steadfast love. That's the God that we serve, and that's the way God uh, produces righteousness in his people, is by leading them with gentleness kindness and slowness to anger. That's the fertilizer that he pours at the roots of his church. And the church, if it's to reflect the God who created it, ought to be the same. You understand a, an angry or a harsh Christian community is a contradiction in terms. God's people ought to be gentle, and kind, and humble. So James, he tells us uh, to toss all the rage away. Look in verse 21. He says, therefore, put away, that, that, that literally is just strip off, like taking off clothing, uh, all filthiness and rampant wickedness. Take it all off and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Uh, filthiness and wickedness, it's uh, it means vulgarity and malice. It speaks about a heart of self-righteous anger, a heart that, that uh, is quick to put others in their place and put others down. He says, take all of that off, and in its place, put your roots down into the implanted word. Uh, to, to, to be implanted means it's not something that, that you produced yourself, but it's something external that was placed inside of you. The, the tree, the gospel tree, the gospel fruit that's growing in your life isn't something that you produced. It's something that God came and dug the soil out and put the roots into. He's saying, dig deeply into the implanted word of God, something that was placed within you that's not a product of your own good work, but is a work of God, and to receive this word with, with meekness, gentleness, and humility. We know this word is the gospel because it says it's able to save your souls and, and we're to receive it with gentleness and humility because of what it says about us. The gospel says to us that, that there is nothing you can do to earn salvation before God, that you are a wicked sinner, that it is the manure of your sin that has fertilized the gospel soil. Uh, that's all you bring to this equation. And Jesus has bred the seed of his own body in the ground to grow out of that. Uh, the good righteousness and works that he gives to you. And so he says, receive this word with meekness and humility. Uh, that, that word meekness can be translated also gentleness. Receive the implanted word, knowing it's been implanted, knowing it's not something you are, knowing it's not something you grew. Receive the gospel with meekness uh, and gentleness. And that ought to make us produce this tangerine, this fruit that he's speaking about, this slowness to anger, uh, slow to speak, quick to listen, would be a gentleness. You, you understand gentleness or meekness is consistently throughout Scripture described as a fruit of the Spirit of God dwelling in his people. Galatians 5.22, the fruits of the Spirit. Anyone learn this in children's ministry? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, what? Gentleness 
and self-control. Gentleness is a fruit. It's a product of the Spirit of God dwelling in his people. It's also, uh, the scriptures say, that's how we're to confront one another within Christian community when we sin against one another. Colossians 3.12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. What do we put on? Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another. If one has a complaint against another, forgiving one another as God has forgiven you. So also you forgive one another. So that's how we dwell as community. It's the gospel soil that makes that gentleness in us. It's an understanding that this is something we receive that we didn't produce. He also says it's how we correct those with false doctrine outside the church. 2 Timothy 2, 24, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting as a gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the church. So the way we speak to one another ought to be gentle and humble. The way we speak to outsiders, even when they're saying false doctrine, we ought to stand up for the truth, but do it with gentleness. Right theology spoken with harsh language does not please God. You understand that? gentleness is a product of the gospel. The way we say things uh, speaks about the truth of the one that we're representing. It speaks about the gospel when we speak with gentleness. It goes on in 1 Peter 3. He says, uh, to honor the Christ is holy. Be prepared to give a defense to anyone who asks for a reason of the hope that's in you. So how do we preach the gospel? With gentleness and respect. Church, this is, this is what it means to be a gospel community. We're to be a people who are saturated with humility and gentleness that's produced by the gospel, that's produced by an understanding of what the gospel says about who we are and what Christ has done for us outside of our earning it. So we cultivate gospel community. The first way uh, J- James speaks about this is by replacing rage or anger with gentleness. And the second is by hearing with your hands. Hearing with your hands. What he calls uh, being a hearer of the word. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you can imagine going into a car dealership, uh, looking for a brand new car, and, uh, and you look around and you see all these shiny new cars with great paint jobs is all new, you open the door, smells fresh, Uh, maybe it's a Tesla and it's got like all the screens and things inside of it. Um, You step back and you start looking around, you realize all of these cars are sitting on the ground without wheels. The manufacturer finished all the detailed process of producing this car, but but forgot to put wheels on at the end and ship them out wheelless. It's ridiculous, right? You never walk into a car dealership and buy a car from a place that forgets to put the wheels on the car when it's done. And James says that hearing the word without doing it is like that. It's like you've spent all this time uh, manufacturing a car, building it from scratch, only to get to the very end, the most important part, the thing that it actually rolls on, and not doing anything with it, not, not putting the wheels on that allow it to move forward. Look in verse, verse 22, he says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves, because anyone who's a hearer of the word and not a doer is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. He looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. See, in James' day, uh, mirrors weren't like the mirrors we have now. It wasn't this crystal clear image of your face. Uh, Mirrors were polished brass, and so it actually took quite a bit of effort to see yourself in a mirror. You'd have to go outside. You'd have to get it just right and kind of polish it and rub it a little bit and and then look carefully and see, you know, where your hair is wrong and where you have mud on your face. And so he's describing this ridiculous scenario where someone takes great expense to get this mirror and goes to great lengths to, to really carefully examine themselves and see that they're filthy and their, their sh- beard is unshaven and they've got the, the shaving cream sitting right there and they've got the soap sitting right there and, and they, they see what's wrong with themselves but then they put the mirror down and walk away and do nothing. They forget to put the wheels on the car. The whole point of all that work was so that you could see what you looked like and do something about it. And he said, you, you just walk away with no response. 
This is James uh, describing that same fruit in another way. The fruit uh, of being, being quick to hear is the fruit uh, of being gentle. It's looking at the gospel and having it produce the same type of gospel attitude within us. And so if we're a people who look deeply into the gospel, if we're a people who study God's word, make all the effort of coming to church on Sunday and, and opening up your scriptures on, on Monday morning and Tuesday morning and you go to Bible study and you go to grow group and you look deeply at the word and you contemplate these deep thoughts about God and, and his loving kindness towards sinners and what a great, wonderful God he is and then you walk away unchanged. You walk away and don't reflect the same kind of kindness that God has shown to us towards others. It's like you've built this beautiful car and put no wheels on it. It's not going anywhere. James says it's, it's worthless. It's useless. What good is all that knowledge if it doesn't change the way we love one another? Walk away with heads full of theology, but, but hearts that lack the kindness and the mercy and the gentleness that God requires. But the opposite is true, that when we do put wheels on the car, when God puts wheels on the car, when we do hear and we also do, uh, it leads to blessing and freedom. Look in verse 25. He said, the one who, who looks into the perfect law, that, that, that looks into, uh, it's like a child with a bug. That, it's got like a magnifying glass. It's captured. It's looking carefully into it, bending down, stooping down, and carefully examining the law, the one who looks into the law, the law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Blessed in his doing. Those who, who look into the law, who look at what the law says about themselves, who persevere when the law says not just people are wicked sinners, but you yourself are a wicked sinner. When it exposes the unrighteousness in your own heart and you persevere and allow the law to condemn you, allow the law to say what it says about you, as it compare yourself to the perfect law that God has given us, and you allow it to say that about you, but you also allow it to lead you to Christ and to show you how Christ himself has paid the penalty that you deserve, how Christ has given you mercy that you didn't deserve, how Christ has been so long-suffering and patient with you when you didn't deserve it, how he has come after you, his love has run after you and run after you and run after you as you continue to run away from him and brought you to himself. When you look at that and it produces within you that same gentleness towards others, oh, you will be blessed. The perfect law is a law of, of liberty, and it leads us to righteousness that is liberty. It's not the kind of external obedience to a set of rules just so people at church think you're righteous. It's a, it's a humbling before God, being honest. I am broken and unrighteous. I have nothing to bring to you. And yet I have a God who's been so good to me, a perfect righteous God who's paid it for me. It allows us to be free as Christians, free as his people, free as a gospel community, to be honest about our brokenness with God honest about our sin with one another, and then walk in freedom, in, dis, in, in obedience to God because he's been so good to us. The chicken's cooked all the way through to the middle, and the center is hot. Oh, what a blessing. Being a, being a, a follower of Jesus, being a Christian like this, doesn't mean you never get angry, you never have sharp words, you never wrestle with bitterness or or wrestle with cynicism, but that we just keep going back to the gospel. We persevere in the gospel. We endure in the gospel. We keep every day going back to that bug, going back to that mirror and looking at what it says about ourselves and saying, yes, Lord, it's true, and not forgetting when we walk away, but going back again and again and taking the mirror and showing it to each other. Do you remember who you are and what Christ has done for you? It's a gospel community that perseveres with the law of liberty. It sets us free to be blessed in our doing and not burdened by our doing. See the difference there? Uh, the law of works righteousness burdens us with doing. The law of Christ blesses us in doing. So we cultivate gospel community. If we want to see this, this gospel culture, this fruit that we're looking for, we, we must re re retain our rage and replace rage with gentleness. Uh, we must hear with our hands, not just hear, but hear and do. And the third way he speaks about this gospel fruit is by, by taming our tongue. 
taming our tongue. Um, I remember uh, when I first got my license. Do we have any new drivers? Any? We have some, some kids who like just started. Yeah, Gabby. So, so when I first got my license and getting out on the highway with that death machine that my parents let me drive, uh, and realize like at a certain point, like when the first time I'm driving all alone, there are no parents in the car, no other people in the car, and uh, I'm flying down the highway at like 85, 90 miles an hour, like a good, responsible teenager. And I realized like, I have control over this vehicle. I could just like, you know, bump into that car next to me and just like ruin everybody's day for a very long time. Uh, like this is incredible. Why do they give this to a 17-year-old kid? Um, Abby's a lot more responsible than I was. And I remember feeling that and just thinking, man, this is, this is so much power. This is so much uh, energy to have behind uh, the wheels of someone so irresponsible. James says our tongues are like that. Um, it's incredibly powerful. Uh, and we are wildly irresponsible with them. Verse 26, he says, if anyone thinks he's religious, you look quite religious, but does not bridle his tongue, but deceives him his heart, that person's religion is worthless. To, to bridle the tongue, it's a picture of, of putting a, a bit in the mouth of a horse. And the reason you do that is you can put the horse uh, to good use. Horses were the cars of James Day. Uh, they could be violent if they were untrained, if they were unbridled. They could hurt someone um, and throw people off. Uh, but a horse with its bits in its mouth could be brought under control for a purpose. It could plow a field in springtime. A, 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 a horse with a bit in its mouth could pull a carriage and, and bring your family somewhere. He says our words are like that. They're capable of, of great good and capable of great harm. They're also capable of just being completely useless. And James says uh, in, in our text, it's not just about harsh words spoken to try to hurt someone that are useless or dangerous or worthless, but careless words, words spoken without a purpose. You understand that? It's, it's not just using my words to hurt someone. It's also carelessly using my words, letting that stallion run free without a bridle in its mouth. It's dangerous. Whoever said sticks and stones can hurt, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me, they were lying through their teeth. Uh, words can hurt far deeper than sticks and stones, and they can stick around for longer. I still remember mean things that were said to me when I was 10, 8, 6 years old. So he says, uh, if you think you're religious and you don't put a bit in your mouth, you don't bridle your mouth for a purpose, you're deceiving yourself about your religiosity. And I want to be clear too here. He is speaking about uh, both careless speech. Uh, you know, the Bible never talks about just speaking your mind, uh, or just saying it like it is. You understand the only way to just say it like it is is to speak Scripture. Uh, we don't see it like it is, so when we speak our minds, we're not necessarily saying it like it is. But he's also talking about um, bridling your tongue uh, for a purpose. So, so um, it doesn't just mean everyone needs to be extroverted and say everything, uh, be, be willing to speak out, or just everyone needs to be introverted and be quiet. Uh, to bridle your tongue is also, for those introverts and quiet ones among us, means bridling your tongue to make it move forward when it wants to be silent. There are times where we ought to speak but we refrain from speaking out of fear. And you also need to put a bridle in the mouth of a horse to make it move forward into battle, uh, to make it move forward into a dark forest or a place where it's afraid, but it must go. And so also we ought to bridle our tongues to put them to work at times when we need to speak up for those who don't have a voice or when we need to speak up for our friend who is in sin and confront them on that sin with gentleness but with purpose. So it's not just about staying silent, but about taking hold of your tongue and directing it for a purpose. And the purpose specifically that, that James speaks of in our text is to show compassion to the afflicted. Look, at, look in verse 17. Why would we bridle our tongue? Uh, religion, so he says, 
A tongue unbridled is false religion. But what is true religion? Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. In James' times, orphans and widows were the most vulnerable members of society. Uh, They were the, the fatherless and those without husbands. In a patriarchal society, they were the neglected and those without any social safety net. And so he says uh, that, that to, to be, uh, have pure and undefiled religion is to use that tamed tongue to go to those who have no support system, to go to the most vulnerable and afflicted among us and dwell with them. Notice how relational the language is here. He doesn't just say uh, to give to the orphans and the widows, uh, to give to a fund that blesses orphans and widows, Uh, to sign up for a newsletter to hear about things that people are doing for orphans and widows. He says, uh, what is pure religion? To visit the orphans and widows in their affliction, to go to where they are and sit with them and speak with them and listen to them. Why do we need to be quick to listen and slow to speak So so that we can sit with the afflicted and hear their stories of affliction? So we can sit with the broken as they weep and weep with them. So that we can go to those who who have no one else they can talk to and let them just unburden themselves upon us and not be so quick to give them a a solution to their afflictions with our lips. That's hard to do, isn't it? It's hard when you hear someone telling a tale of woe and you can see where their responsibility is weaved throughout that tale. Uh, To not just, well, this is all your fault but to sit and listen and show compassion and gentleness. And then gently lead them perhaps to a place where they can find a way out of their affliction. Oh, but that takes a bridled tongue. It takes a a careful words and a heart uh, that's humble and gentle. That's true religion, he says. That's where you see real gospel fruit. That's a car with wheels on it. (laughs) This is exactly what Jesus speaks of in Matthew 25. I read this a few weeks ago. He he tells this parable about about a king, and he speaks about this in the future day when when God brings all his people to himself. It would be like a king who says, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. People will say, when did I do that? He says, as you did to the least of these, my brothers, you did this to me. True religion is going to the weak and the impoverished, going to the the burdened and the afflicted and dwelling with them. This is what God has done with us, hasn't he? How would it be if God had just concerned himself with those who had their act together? Spiritually, physically, relationally, none of us would be in his kingdom. And yet he has come, the strong to the weak, the powerful to the poor, the eternal to the perishing, so that he might bring us life. And he didn't just... Uh, God didn't just send us a care package from on high. He himself came to dwell with us in the flesh. Jesus came to walk among us. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. He came and he made us his own children. That's the kind of love our Father has shown to us. And a gospel community is one whose, whose gospel culture takes its roots deep into that gospel truth and lives that out towards one another. If, a, if the gospel that we preach, if the truth, if the hope that we proclaim is true, then, then the church, Palm Vista, us, us, the people sitting right here, ought to have an outsized concern for the weakest among us, uh, for, the, for the immigrant, for the poor, uh, for the elderly, for the disabled, for those uh, living with joblessness and homelessness, that, that we would be those who are, who are quick to sit with them and listen, to love them uh, and unburden them and take their burdens upon ourselves. can't imagine what, what would it look like uh, if, if every member, every family at Palm Vista, every month spent a day or half a day just, just visiting with uh, an elderly person in our community, in our neighborhood, or sitting with someone uh, who, is, 
who is just struggling with joblessness, struggling at home, depression and, and despair, and just sitting and listening to one another. Um, it would be transformative. It would be transformative for our church, transformative for our neighborhood. Um, it would be a Ferrari with wheels. But here's the thing. Uh, I look at my own schedule, I look at my own life, and I see a lot of maybe one wheel on the car, right? Um, when I look at my life, I see, you know, it's like, it's like it's dragging three axles, but one wheel is kind of pulling it forward. And I, and I think about, God, where, where is this going to happen? How is it possible that I can uh, practice this kind of true religion? How can I live this way? I look at my lips and the way that they speak. I look at my heart and the cynicism and anger that's built up there. I look at my hands and the lack of care for and concern for the lowly among us. And my temptation is to despair, just throw up my hands and say, oh, I can't do this. But I want to turn to John 14. Because in John 14, 15, Jesus says something very, very similar to this. We're going to actually study this uh, when we get back into our John series. But he says in John 14, 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That sounds very similar. If, we, if we're a gospel community, we're going to do what he is commanded to do. Don't just hear, but, but act. But notice Jesus he doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop with just saying, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. He goes on in verse 16. He says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. That's the Holy Spirit. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, for you know him. For he dwells with you and we will be in you. And then verse 18, and I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. See, our hope to be a community like this is not in the fact that we're going to stir up enough compassion that we can now obey God. That's the gospel that, that that's, the, that's works that does not lead to righteousness that pleases God. That's just trying to put on another structure to please God. Well, now I've got to visit orphans if I'm going to please God, so let me add that to my list of things I can do to make God happy with me. No, what he's saying is this is a product of what God has already done for you. He's already purchased you by his blood. He's already sent his spirit to dwell within you. He's already promised not to leave you as an orphan. So that would stir us up to then love and serve out of a heart of generosity for what God has done for us. So this is not to be one more burden to place on our shoulders to weigh us down in order I can do these things now to be a good religious boy or girl. No, this is a product of a community who's got gospel roots who sees that this is the way God has loved us, so also we get to love one another. It's a privilege. Those who do these things, he says, will be blessed when they do them. So it's a blessing, and it's a delight. And I can tell you, when you do go and sit with someone who is burdened, someone who is weighed down, sitting with them in their affliction, uh, it is a blessing to them, oh, but it's a blessing to us as well. When we get to be the hands and the feet of Jesus uh, to those that he treasures and delights, uh, and to the least of these. So church, we get the privilege of cultivating gospel community. And we get the privilege of doing that uh, uh, by mirroring Jesus, by replacing rage with gentleness, by hearing with our hands, and by taming our tongues. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the incredible mercy you have poured out upon us. Lord, thank you that you are not an angry, vengeful, raging God. Uh, Lord, but you are slow to anger, abounding in compassion for your people. Lord, thank you that you are a God who is gentle with your words, who is, who is purposeful with your words. You have never spoken a word, O Lagos, from the beginning. You have never spoken a word that was not purposeful for the good of your people. And Lord, you have given us your very words that we might study and understand them. Lord, thank you that, that you are a God uh, who doesn't just speak, but also does, who does what he says, Lord God. And Lord, thank you that you are a God that is compassionate to the weak and the lowly. 
that you have not left us as orphans, but you came, died on the cross, and rose from the dead, that we too might dwell with you, Lord, and that you have sent your very spirit to dwell with us in our affliction, Lord, to dwell with us when we are all alone, and when there's no one around uh, to, to understand what we're going through, when there are burdens deep in our hearts, Lord, that we can't even express with our lips, God, that you have given us your very spirit to dwell with us there, and that we have a God who knows us. Oh, Lord, and thank you that we get the privilege of living that out to one another in community. Lord, would you make Palm Vista that kind of gospel community, that we have the truth of the scriptures, Lord, but that truth lived out action in compassion, in kindness, and in mercy to the least of us. Lord, I pray that you would bring repentance uh, this morning, Lord God, if there are those uh, who have anger, in unkindness, perhaps, a cynicism built up in their hearts, Lord, that you would expose that. Uh, if there is a pattern of anger and rage, Lord, that that would be exposed. But God, that the, the fertile soil of the gospel, Lord, uh, would be a place where they can take those sins and place them in the dirt before you, Lord, and be honest about them and allow them to fertilize, uh, Lord, just gratitude that produces gentleness and kindness. Lord, I pray that for parents with their children, uh, God, it's so easy, Lord, for us to, to, to try to manipulate our children with harsh words to get them to conform to an external righteousness instead of uh, showing them the kindness and long-suffering mercy of the living God that they might be drawn to you in your gentleness. Lord, it's easy for us to do that, uh, Lord God, in our other relationships, at work, with our roommates and our friends, Lord God. Lord, it's easy for us to do that with ourselves, to turn that rage and anger inward and hatred towards ourselves, thinking that our self-hatred is going to produce some sort of righteousness. Oh, Lord, but that's not what produces righteousness. It's your kindness to us. It's seeing your goodness to us that produces the kind of righteousness that you require. Oh, so, Lord God, would you uh, we repent, Lord God, of our, uh, of our selfishness and self-righteousness, and we ask you for a mercy, Lord God, that moves us to the least of these. Just take a moment now before we sing uh, this next uh, song just to do business with God. If you're here specifically, if you're here and you're an unbeliever and you've never trusted in Jesus for salvation, um, you're still trying to be a good boy or girl and, and have enough religiosity that you think God will accept you one day when you stand before him, let me tell you, you are never going to be good enough. You're never going to do enough good things to please God. But Jesus has already done that for you. Uh, and if you receive him this morning, you can have life and have it eternal. And you can have his righteousness and have freedom and righteousness that comes from a heart of delight in God, not a heart that burdens you down with extra things you have to do. So if that's you, I, I just encourage you, pray right now. Lift up to the Lord your heart and say, Lord, this is my sin. I see it all. You see it all, Lord Jesus. I surrender it to you. Would you give me your righteousness? Give me your goodness. Give me... Uh, your mercy, Lord God. Accept me as your child. Adopt me as your son and daughter. And receive now eternal life purchased for you on the cross. I want us to respond by singing this song, Take My Life, because this song is really a prayer. It's not a song that says, I commit to doing these things. It's a song that says, God, uh, take me and, and, and shape me into a person who does these things. It's holding up our lives, holding up our lips, holding up our voice, holding up our intellect, holding up our will, holding up our heart and our feet, holding up every part of ourselves to him and saying, Lord, here's what I am. It's corrupted. It's, it's broken. Would you shape it and make it into your image? Would you use me, Lord, for your kingdom? And in doing so, we have all the delight of his presence. So please, if you would, let's stand if you're able. And, uh, and let's sing this song together, Take My Life.